Uh, therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm therefore yourselves also for the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer under the lusts of men, but only for the will of God. For the time has already passed, is sufficient for you, and, has, and for you to carry out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lusts, drunkenness, carousals, drinking parties, abominable idolatries, and all of this they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excess of dissipations. So they malign you. But they shall give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Therefore, for the gospel has this very purpose, has been preached even to those who are dead, that though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the spirit according to the will of God. The end of all things is quick at hand. Therefore, be of sound judgment, sober of spirit, and for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love, therefore, one another, because love can cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. As each one has received a special gift, therefore, employ it in serving one another as good stewards, part of the manifold grace of God. Whoever then speaks, let him speak, as it were, from the, uh, the very utterance of God. Whoever serves, let him do so by the strength which God supplies. So in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs all glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. My beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal amongst you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that at the revelation of his glory, you may also rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled in the name of Christ, consider yourself blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests always upon you. By no means let any of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him never feel ashamed. But in the name, let him glorify God. For it is time for the judgment to begin with the household of the Lord. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous are saved, what then should become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, let all of those who suffer according to the will of God entrust then their souls to a faithful creator and continue doing what is right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What do you think about this chapter? Uh -huh. Well, there's, there's suffering, but if he... Well, it's a time of persecution. you got to remember, it's the middle of the first century. It's the middle of the first century. Um, Rome is in charge of everything. Nero is at the helm. And after Nero would become uh, Domitian, I think. And after Domitian came Vespasian. And the three of them together, uh, now, as we look back at it, history calls the reign of terror. Because they brought uh, murder and genocide to a fine art. Made it a sport, actually. Uh, a blood sport. And in fact, that's where we get the term blood sport, is from those Caesars that reigned who thought nothing of life and had all power and dominion in that day and age and could kill and orchestrate the killing of any and all people that they just decided to kill. 
and primarily Christians were a prime target and they became the victims of just innocent slaughtering for no reason other than the fact that Rome could do it. But how would you characterize this chapter in one word, if you would? One word. I'm thinking of one word. One word. Oh, it's Mother's Day, isn't it? Happy Mother's Day. Huh? Close. Close, but not quite. Well, take our example from Christ's suffering. Well, let's just say... I don't know if I spelled that correctly. Consequences. You know, people always say that, oh, I ain't hurting anybody but myself. And that's, you know, no stupider statement was ever uttered. And I've used the illustration many times of the billiard table. You have a billiard table and a rack of billiard balls on it. And you have a cue ball, which is you. And the minute you enter this life and breathe your first is the cue whacking you. Whereupon, you know, you fly out of there this way and begin to impact other individuals who have been previously born before you. I mean, there's not a baby born where somebody isn't already saying, oh, isn't she cute? Oh. In fact, I used to teach a kid in, in Pinecrest when I was a teacher, uh, a little black girl, and her name was Shikuti. <laughs> and she was named that way because when Grandma first saw her, she said, isn't she a cutie? So they named her Shikuti. <laughs> oh, you damned that child for the rest of her life with a stupid name. Because grandma said she was cute. Impact is the point I'm trying to make. Everything you think, everything you do, everything you even think about doing has impact. And you go, well, I'm thinking about something, but it's nobody else here. It's just me. Well, then it has impact on you, doesn't it? Throughout the scripture, you see God over and over again, as Peter does in the last chapter. Don't fill your mind with the bad stuff, the sexes and the sensual stuff. and Don't fill your mind with that stuff, because if you fill your mind with that stuff, eventually it's going to direct you in a wrong path. It's going to take you down the wrong road. So even if you're by yourself, which you never are, but even if you are by yourself and you, you, you turn from the trail, you turn from the path of God's righteousness. This is God's righteousness here. If you start to sway from it, either to the left or to the right, so as the scripture says, turn neither to the left or to the right. Uh, even if it's just you and you start to think like that, it starts to take you out of here. So to say, oh, I'm not impacting any, anybody. Well, you are, you're impacting yourself. More importantly than mom and dad, and your brothers and sisters, your friends and your school teachers, the other people in the church. You, you impact a lot of people by what you do. You know, I always find it amazing when, uh, when somebody kills somebody or something like that and they interview the neighbors. Oh, he was a good guy, a sweet kid. He mowed my yard and washed my car. Well, now he's a murderer. You know, you don't think they're, that's gonna impact those people? I was living next to this kid all this time, letting him in my house, eating lunch with him, and he turns out to kill eight people. You see what I'm saying? Everything you do, whether it directly affects them or not, will affect them. Therefore, all of life becomes what? It becomes a responsibility. You know what the last two generations of this nation are worst at? Responsibility. responsibility. I failed because everyone was against me. 
I dropped out of school because school sucks. And teachers are rotten and lessons are worthless. And school this, and, you know, it's everybody's fault but mine. And who do we have to, who, who's our best example of this? Well, for the last 20 years, it's been our teachers, it's been our professors, it's been our government, it's been everybody and their mother saying, oh, well, it's not their fault. Parents have stepped in and said, you know, lay off my child, it's not his fault. I don't know, remember when you guys were growing up, when I was back in the 50s, if I screwed something up, wham, I knew it immediately. There was no question as to who screwed up. It was me and I paid for it immediately. And eventually, and I did the same thing to my kids, eventually they grow to be responsible human beings. And they say, you know, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna do this. I'm gonna be considerate of everybody else because they were taught that. Well, the last two generations of kids coming up, we've taught them to be irresponsible. And subsequently, they're not in church. And because they're not in church, they're growing more irresponsible. The whole continent of the United States of America is trying to get rid of the Bible. Why? Because it teaches and speaks of responsibility. And when you slack on the responsibility or you, you slide on it and you pass it by, well, then you have consequences. And when the consequences happen, you know, the biggest claim is not my fault. When in fact, the Lord says it is your fault. And there's no way around that. I didn't know. Yes, you did. But Lord, I didn't. Yes, you did. You decided this way. So why are you surprised? He says, why are you? don't be surprised. If you're a murderer or a thief or a robber or whatever, and you get caught and you suffer for it, why is that a surprise? You know murders against the law, and yet how many murders occur every day in the United States of America? We have the strictest murder laws in the world. And yet, what happens? People kill each other. Some for good reason, some for no reason, some just because they can. Yes, it is your fault. Well, I didn't know. Yes, you did know. We have laws against rape. How many people are raped every day? We have laws against theft. And yet people right now, as I'm talking to you, are at home on a computer trying to break into somebody's identity and steal everything they have. We have laws against all manner of things, evil, and yet that's exactly what people do. And they don't care. Well, if the Bible does nothing else, it teaches us that God cares and as he says you will not give a cup of cool water to a child that goes unnoticed well you're not gonna lack you know slack on your responsibility that goes unnoticed either everything you think say and do before there is a word on your lips the Lord knows it before you act upon a whim the Lord knows it where can you go that you might hide from the Lord? If you go to the uttermost parts of the earth, even there his right hand is upon your shoulder and his left hand guides you. Where can you go if you call the mountains to fall upon you? Did not the Lord make those mountains and he knows exactly where you are? You see what I'm trying to tell you? And somehow, some way, we forgot about that and the world is, even California right now, is passing a law to where Bibles can no longer be sold. Or traded or anything. They haven't passed it yet. Well, there, the legislation is yeah, before it's the. In legislation. Don't overthink the metaphor. The point I'm trying to say is that people right now are using the law to get away from the Bible. And if it starts there, where will it end? The Quran is okay, but the Bible, no. They've also used the law about to discipline your children, too. Oh, yeah. They're trying to get rid of the Bible because the Bible speaks of individual and corporate responsibility to one another and the subsequent 
consequences if you, de if you deny that. So they're trying to get rid of it. The Quran is okay because the Quran is mostly might makes right. If it's good in your eyes, it's good as long as you know, uh, as long as you follow the rules of Muhammad, which are pretty much anything goes. The Quran is a religion of man's desire, a man-made. So it's okay, uh, the Quran, but the Bible is God-made. In the Quran, you're, you're responsible only to other guys in your belief. In the Bible, you're responsible to God, of which, by the way, you have no say. It is what it is. His word will not change. We're told that, and that not one iota of his word will ever change. He will not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he said, don't steal, Today, he means don't steal. If he said don't murder, today he means don't murder. If he said this is not okay then, it's still not okay today, even though America said, minus this, uh, you're not hurting anybody but yourself. Wrong. From the moment you breathed your first breath, you were no longer alone, not on this planet. From the moment you took your first breath, opened your eyes for the first time, you might have been a little tiny baby and didn't know it, but you're no longer alone. You're part of a greater community, and therefore you are responsible to that greater community, and if not to the community, to yourself, because you are a part of God's creation. So if you can't be responsible to anybody else, be responsible to yourself, because you Basically, you are rented equipment. <laughs> you don't belong to you, by the way, if you believe in God. The earth is the Lord's and everything therein. That means you're a rented piece of equipment. I'm a rented piece of equipment. I don't belong to me. I belong to the Lord. And I better return it in a pretty good condition from which it was made. Amen. If I don't, then that's on me. You know, you go to Joe's Rent All down here and you rent a, I don't know, a, a, a post hole digger or something. And you try and take it through concrete and all that stuff and tear up the blade and ruin the auger and all that and burn out the motor. And you take it back to them. What's going to happen? They're going to make you pay for it. They're going to say, no, sir, this is not the condition. We rented this to you. You go down to Joe Blow's Rent-A-Car and rent a car. What do they do? They go out and look at the car all over and, you know, mark any dents or dings or scratches. And if you bring it back to them when the whole front end smooshed in, what's going to happen? That's how simple it is in our physical life. But somehow we think that, oh, well, my child's not to blame. That's my, not my child's fault. Yeah, he started three fights at school today. Yes, he called the teacher a bad name. Yes, he stole some other kid's lunch money. But that's not his fault. The question the Bible would bring up today is how, on God's good earth, how is that not his fault? How is that not his fault? Nobody forced him to do that. He did it on his own volition. How is that not his fault? I can only think of one thing. What's that? It's a lot of responsibility to know that the father did. Oh, no. That's, you know. To raise them, not to. But it's the child's fault for the crime. It's still their fault. You see. It might have been influenced by the parents, and that's true. But it's the child's fault. He committed a crime. If I get in my truck right now and drive down I-4 at 190 miles an hour, well, not my truck, but if I had a truck that could go 190 miles an hour and drive down I-4 and lost control of that truck and it started flipping and going crazy and smashed four other cars and went off the road and fell into a mall and killed a bunch of kids in the daycare, whose fault is that? That was my parents' fault because they didn't teach me how to drive good enough. No. That was my fault. I drove too fast. I broke the laws. I lost control of the truck. And subsequently, a lot of people paid 
for my stupidity and my recklessness. If there's no fault to be laid anywhere, it would be on their parts. They were just at the mall shopping. They were just driving down the road trying to go to grandma's house. It's 100% my fault. And that's what Peter says here. He says, be aware. If you suffer because you're a murderer, don't be surprised. But if you suffer because you're just preaching love in Christ, be proud of that. Because not one thing that's happening to you is being neglected by the Lord. Ever. On the other hand, if you're not doing what you should be doing, then be concerned. Because on that day, judgment is already at hand, not by God's hand, but by your own. By your own. Problem with Christianity today is no, we, we're just like the rest of society. We somehow, we, we Christians think, oh, well, we're different from everybody else. Mm, I'm not so sure we are. The divorce rate amongst Christians is about 66%. The divorce rate amongst heathens is about 66%. What's the difference there? Well, when we divorce our spouse, we, we do it lovingly. <laughs> what does that mean? There's no difference. So when the rest of the world is shirking the responsibility, I hate to be judgmental here, but I think a lot of Christians are too. You know what? I'll give you a perfect example. If I gave you tickets to Disney World that were only good Sunday morning, would you be in church? 99% of people would not be in church. If I gave you tickets to Universal that were only good Sunday morning, would you be in church? Unless you were a Catholic, then you could go Saturday night. That would be a loophole. <laughs> I remember when they started that in the Catholic Church. Oh, what an uproar. Even the Pope spoke to it. God does not talk to his people on Saturday night. What? <laughs> God doesn't pay attention to his people on Saturday night. Pope whatever at the time. When you have communion in your church, you are to sit there quietly for at least 20 minutes until God leaves your body. <laughs> what? <laughs> These were rules, and I'm thinking, okay. Next 20 minutes, I gotta behave myself until God's out of here, and then I can go back to being a heathen. A little bit weird, huh? That's the point Peter's trying to make. Everything you do, always, since the day you drew your first breath, will have subsequent impact on yourself and everybody else. Therefore, you need to remain ever diligent in responsibility to your calling to the Lord. As God has called you to be, so be. Otherwise, there will be, not there might be, there will be consequences, some immediate. I mean, if you lose control of your car and kill somebody else in another car, some consequences are immediate. Others will be eventual, but they will be. And a whole lot of Christians aren't understanding that. And a whole lot of Christians, I'm not talking about the godless people, Christians are just as irresponsible when it comes to the things of the Lord as the heathens, as the, as the godless people. I, talk, I say all the time, you've heard me use this cliche a million times, if you want to know of God, you can come to church uh, or Bible study on Tuesday or Sunday morning and I can teach you everything about God. I've learned it, I've studied it for 40 years, I've tried to practice it, I've, you know, I've got a PhD in it, in a biblical interpretation. But I can't make you come to church. I can't make you love the Lord. I can teach you all about God and what He requires, but I can't make you do it. You see, as much as I want to, you better. <laughs> much as I want to, I cannot. That's a wholly and completely under your government. What you decide to do, you will do. 
If you want to come to church, you'll come to church. If you want to love God, you'll love God. If you want to serve and be part of the, 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 the working, uh, working of the church, if you want to accept personal responsibility and be a bondservant of the Lord as He asks you to do, that is 100% under your power, not Pastor Tom's, not the denomination, not anybody. That's where it comes right back to you. That's what this chapter is trying to say. Christianity, we talked about Christianity being uh, a service. That's true. It's a verb. It's an ongoing, everyday kind of adventure. It's also a state of being where you are uh, molded, defined, and, and, and illuminated through the Word of God, not through your own selfish lusts or desires, but it's also a responsible religion. Responsible to everybody. First and foremost, you value God. Second, you value life. Hopefully your own life. And consequently, everybody else's life. And it's in that value of God and in that value of life that the true Christian is born. No, we don't do random acts of evil. We do random acts of kindness. And by the way, in God's world, they're not random. <laughs> they're ordered. We do ordered acts of kindness. They're planned acts of kindness. Not random acts of kindness. I've always hated that verse. I know it's cute and everybody talks about it, but not to the Christian. Nothing's random to the Christian, or it shouldn't be. It should be ordered. It should be planned. It should be expected. And it should be purposed. And that's what he talks about here. Having a purpose in Christ. This isn't something you gotta do. It should be something you wanna do. And you wanna do it every day, day after day, month after month, year after year. You know what's so cool if you go to some of these older, older, older churches? See these old ladies. I used to have them up in Kentucky. 93 years old and they, they you know they try and stand up and they get their hymnal and they're warbling out some old song Lord bless the it's the worst sound in the world and I would sit there and listen to them and I go God this is painful and they would sing it and a few of them would try and hit that old high note you know oh. <laughs> it's long since gone like 40 years ago and it would just be horrible and uh, they get done and they would sit down and they'd be almost pleased with themselves. You know, they go, yeah, boy, I gave God my best today. And I'm sitting there going, somebody shoot me. But I'd ask them afterward. I'd talk to them after the service and that stuff. I said, when was the first time? Oh, I've been coming to church since my mom brought me at two years old. And now she's 97. And she's still sitting in that church belting out those tunes, warbling, barely able to stand. Many times I've caught myself saying, God, I hope I can live a life like that old lady. Hope I can warble out a few songs when I'm 97, if I ever am privileged to live that long. Not so with our modern generation. Not so. Churches are devoid of any young people. Youth groups are failing across the country. Even denominational efforts like Chick and Young Life and uh, Campus Crusades all failing. Because the kids are no longer interested. And the world's telling them they don't have to be. Eventually it's going to make it a law that you can't be interested. We are damning generations of children to first of all a loaf of some life with a hellish consequence oh mom and dad what you do when you train up a child in the way of the Lord is no small thing no small thing it is a fearful thing to train up a child with the absence of God said the rabbi Sooner or later, that child will become a curse upon not just the community, but upon the entire world. To train up a child in the absence of God. That's a 
Hebrew prayer from their ancient wedding service when a young couple got married. He would remind them. Because what are they going to do? Well, they're going to go hoo-ha and make babies. So part of the ancient wedding service, no longer today, but in the old days, it was it's a horrible thing to raise up a child in the absence of God. You don't even know how horrible. Now we have them shooting up schools and shooting up churches and shooting up everything. Well, whose fault is it? The government says it's the gun's fault. <laughs> That's why I'm so fat. It's the fork's fault. We didn't have, we had stricter fork laws in this nation. I wouldn't be as bad as I am. You know, it's the drive throughs fault. It's about as stupid a thought as ever there was. It's the gun's fault. It's the rake's fault. I'll kill you with a rake. <laughs> drive through caused uh, bad consequences too. Sometimes it caused diabetes. Yes, but they have the meats. What? They have the meats. <laughs> I've got to go. They have the meats. All right, that's chapter four, folks. We'll finish it up next week and you'll see him draw all of these things together that we've been talking to. The being, the verb, the responsibility, the consequence, and then finally the whole nine yards. And we'll draw it all together in his last letter. You gotta remember, this is coming from Peter, who was probably what? The most irresponsible of all of them. So it's amazing he would write a letter like this. He was the impetuous one, the look before you leap. I mean, the leap before you look. So, you know, shoot first, we'll ask questions later. He was the impetuous, irresponsible one. So for him to write a letter like this is pretty ma magnificent. All right, that's all I got. Go away.